Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Friday, March 15th. It is a live one. Derek and Riper, Eno Saris, Trevor May, all here with you on this Friday. On this episode, we got some news on Garrett Cole. We have rumors about Blake Snell. We have some new faces in new places that have intrigued us that we're going to discuss in some detail. We're going to take a deep dive into curveballs, and we got some Q&A coming up a little later in the show as well. Listener leagues are blowing up. We're up to five listener leagues we may actually have to cut it off soon so Ooh. yeah just a heads up there get in if you haven't done so already the link is inside the discord so be sure to jump in there let's just get right to it we have some news on garrett cole no ucl tear detected he's still expected to miss one to two months it just feels like we're in this holding pattern i saw uh, some analysis from a few different physicians out there that they weren't the ones that read the mri or anything like that but it's still it still kind of feels like this is a possible like long-term problem lurking until we hit some kind of prolonged stretch where Garrett Cole is healthy and pitching effectively again, right? So like what like, Trevor, do you have a point in your career where you were you know, waiting for something like this where you didn't have a a clear tear or something that was known to be a major problem but you had to work through this sort of window of uncertainty? Uh, yeah, actually, all of 2016, uh, mm. I had a back issue and that we couldn't, I don't know, we the diagnosis didn't seem quite right. And it just seemed like it was like, uh, like, hey, just do this rehab program and then strengthen everything around it. And it'll be, you know, you'll feel better at some point. Uh, that uncertainty, it, it sucks. I, I'm, I'm honestly, my Tommy John surgery, uh, my tear was so clean that it was just like, I just knew what need, I knew what the next like 16 months were going to look like immediately, which was really nice at least if you're going to be hurt you want to know what's going on and then how to fix it right away um yeah hearing that about cole is but is not is not great i it's it has that feeling like we're in a holding pattern and uh let's see if he feels better that's just mm -hmm. never anything you want to hear because uh, i feel like this could be recency bias but it, it's usually a lot longer than they're anticipating well have we heard any details like i this is the first i'm seeing no ucl tear like do, have you seen any other details? Like, I haven't, what haven't seen anything like a PRP is? injection or anything. I haven't even seen like a, a diagnosis. It's just, I said his elbow like, hurt. And then, yeah, they're, like, they're probably like, there's inflammation in the area. I guarantee you that's what they like. Mm. Yes, so that's what happens when things hurt. <laughs> that's yeah. what and it is. When there's inflammation in the area, you have you seen your, your own MRIs? Have I? Have yes. You, have you been like walked through like what you're looking at and like you, you, yeah. So you've like when you, so, an MRI, if there's like inflammation around the area, does that make it hard to see if there's a tear? Like, does yes. inflammation block what you might see? Yes. So the the biggest, the best way to find out if there is a tear in your elbow is uh, like with uh, with an arthrogram, which uh, I, I won't get. It's it's a little bit awful because, but it's like you put dye in the area, and then that dye is like can travel um mm. within a muscle and then if there's a like tendons block you'll see a bright you'll see the connection. no color somewhere you'll yeah like, so oh. like color will go somewhere it's not supposed to be and that means uh -huh. there's a tear like for mine it was just like it, my it, the color's yellow and they just pulled up the image and before it even start like before it even the whole thing was yellow so he's like yeah it's everywhere uh, <laughs> no, it's gone it's not even leaking it's gone so um it was, i knew immediately he just said oh, we're gonna see if it's yellow or not and he opened it he's like whoa and i was like whoa okay <laughs> I guess. Um, but again if there's lots of inflammation or swelling uh that mm -hmm. might close that up and that might not even work so uh it, mm -hmm. it is kind of a guess and check a lot of times um you got to wait for things to calm down before you can see uh, what's going on but uh so know, again, basically they're gonna take another mri in in, in, like, in, in four weeks or something and like, yeah. the swelling yeah. will be down and then they might get they might be like oh well it was a tear that happens very often yeah that, that's common yeah so there's there's the land of uncertainty we're living in with garrett cole and if you're in the position of brian cashman you have to decide do i take advantage of the fact that blake snell and jordan montgomery are still out there as free agents do i go ahead and throw money at the problem because in a world where Garrett Cole's not available, you've got Rodon, you've got Stroman, you've got Nestor Cortez, you got Clark Schmidt, you kind of have the open competition with a lot of younger guys, maybe Luis Heel stepping up into that number five spot. I mean, you know, do you think there's a, a pressing need for the Yankees to go out and make an addition, or do you trust the depth enough for them to weather the storm, even if this does turn into a longer term absence for Cole? You know, I kind of like the idea of Snell because Snell, when he's in, can pitch like an ace. 
And the question is only when is he in? And so you kind of just like line up the when is he in with the other guys? <laughs> You're like, okay, Snell will be healthy to begin the season. And then if he's not later on, then hopefully Cole will be back, you know? Um, and I don't think that throwing, you know, like Jordan Montgomery, I like, but they decided at some point the Yankees decided he's not that much different from when they decided this, that he's not a playoff rotation guy. You know, they traded them away because they had their three or four of the playoff rotation guys. They traded him for Harrison Bader. May, I don't think he's actually improved since then. I think he's just been in a good situation and pitched well. I don't, I don't see any sort of like, oh, he did this or he pitched this way or he didn't. No, he's like, same the guy. So I think Snell represents more like, hey, we lost our number one and here's a guy who can pitch like a number one. The only question is innings. And I think, you know, to some extent, maybe they would like uh, what the rumor is that Snell is looking for right now, which is kind of the pitcher version of the Matt Chapman deal, which is something with a high AAV and some opt outs. I think that might be okay for the Yankees. You know, they don't get they don't get locked into something long term, and maybe they can they can set their eyes on some sort of cap reset. You know, two or three years in the future, but. You know, Brian Cashman, this is one of the first years, I think, that he really has fire under his ass. <laughs> I mean, this last year was the first time they missed the playoffs in like, I don't know, 12 years or something. I mean, something ridiculous. Um, and he hasn't won it all in a while. And I think there's a little bit of pressure on him. I think that's fair. And I think the concern you would have is that even if Cole misses two months and ends up being fine, which does seem like the less likely outcome based on where things stand today, you still have a group of guys that have a lot of injury problems in their recent their history, yeah. <laughs> right? Between Rodon and Cortez and Clark Schmidt. So you really don't trust that all three of those guys stay healthy start to finish. So your trust level in the likes of Heal and Will Warren and Beater has to be really, really high if you don't go out and do something. Interesting thing, too, is that we're seeing some reports. Uh, this one's from Chandler Rome, The Athletic, that uh, the Astros remain engaged in the starting pitching market, specifically Blake Snell could be a fit in Houston, which, I mean, that would bump them from probably like a top 10 rotation to clearly inside the top five, wouldn't it, Trevor? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> it's uh, it's like, uh, that, that that would be really good for them. Um, and they have already done one kind of out of nowhere move with Hater. So yeah. uh, now I'm like, now I'm not putting anything past them and and letting them swoop in to, to really try to lock in that eight straight uh, ALCS. Um, I, I, if I'm another team, I, I just, now I'm li like, if I'm the Yankees, I'm like, we, we, we not only can we, <laughs> do we need him, we can't let them have him. Yeah. yeah uh, Cause they've always been meeting in the ALCS and they can, they keep getting beat. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> that's just another, that would be another thing. Just, wow. I can't believe this happened again. Um, but yeah, he would fit really, really well in that rotation and they have the bullpen. Uh, even the innings thing, like it's just a good fit because they have such a, a quality bullpen to get to that if he were throwing the five, five plus regularly and they had a, you know, two nothing lead, they're in a good shape. Yeah, it'd be the kind of lift, I think, that we just saw the Padres get with the addition of Dylan Cease in terms of taking a good rotation and making it a great one. You know, you wrote about that a little bit for the Athletic today, the best rotations in baseball. I mean, I think having a top five rotation just off the cuff makes you a playoff contender. That alone is good enough. Unless your offense is just horrific, you're going to be a team that's in contention all season long. So uh, as you went through that process, were there any teams that popped a little higher than you expected? I mean, I know we're talking and thinking about pitching all the time on this show, but was there any, any group of pitchers that just by the projections were above where you thought they'd be? Um, you know, the Phillies by Fangrass had the second best and um, it's just one of those sneaky rotations. I think the park covers up a lot of things where you're just like, you know, you like look at their ERAs and you're like, they're not, those aren't their greatest ERAs. They, you know, they haven't had great defenses behind them in the past too. So like, you know, they have these high threes ERA. And so you're like, eh, they're good. But then when you kind of look at how many they strike out, how many they walk and how deep they are and what they've got, you're like, oh, that, that, that could be one of the best rotations in, in ball. So I think the Phillies were a big, were kind of a surprise. They, they show up like top three. If you look by fan graphs, um, when I did it by stuff plus, like, uh, it was a little bit more what I expected. Uh, the Mariners were like, you know, second, I think. And, uh, the Astros were like third or fourth and, um, the Padres made the list, um, and it made the top five. So, 
you know, the stuff plus list, I'm so deep in that, that I'm always working in that. Like I wasn't, I wasn't too surprised, but uh, the Astros gained and the Padres gained when you looked at it, but just by stuff plus uh, because, you know, cease uh, for all his flaws uh, did represent a huge stuff upgrade for the back end of that uh, Padres rotation. Do you guys have a favorite for their number five spot now? I mean, they got Johnny Brito, Randy Vasquez, Matt Waldron, Pedro Avila, Robbie Snelling. A uh, lot of options now that they've made another addition. Anyone pop? I want I, Waldron. You want Waldron? You want a knuckleball? I want the knuckleball. Yeah. Like, just from a, from a, yay, we got another one. Uh, a yeah. new guy to check in on. And uh, every once in a while, he's going to have some of the grossest swings and misses and those just nails night outings uh yeah that's just fun i think but that's that's just where i'm coming from there <laughs> yeah i think that would be fun i i did sit in on a johnny brito start with uh my uh eldest and we actually uh because spring training is so cheap we got like eighth row ninth row seats um behind home plate and we were sitting among the scouts uh, my uh my mom was laughing that all the scouts were wearing the same brand of clothing of course yeah. <laughs> Taylor made hats and that's it. Uh, I think it was Travis Taylor. I don't know. No, shirts. that's that's the one. It's the Matthews. Yeah. It's What's Matthew that? shirts. Yeah. It's a T something T something Matthews, right? Tra uh, it's Travis Matthew, I think. Travis Matthew. That's what they were oh, wearing. Okay. Oh, I know. They were Travis Matthew. I think a while ago it used to be like Lululemon was the big thing. But I guess Travis Matthews the big one. So like yeah. we like we had literally like four guys in a row, Travis Matthew on the back of their shirt, like right in front of us. Uh, and I was playing with uh, with my son being like, you know, imagine standing in like what 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 pitch was that? What pitch was that? Um, and the thing that was that really kind of uh, stood out for me was that Brito, he did get a little bit um, like nervous when against Mike Trout. I think he had like a, a pitch clock violation and a guy stole a base on him and he was really trying to get Mike Trout out. But the good news was he got Mike Trout out twice. Um, I saw him have a plan with his sinker and I think it was a new cutter. Uh, against lefties. I think his sinker is actually good enough that he can do stuff with it against lefties, which is a, a, a hot, tough thing for a lot of sinker ballers. I think it's a really good sinker. I think it's good enough to 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 get by. I think his sinker and his breaking ball are two pitches that are better than anything Randy Vasquez has. Um, and so my favorite is Johnny Burrito for the number five there. Uh, my youngest kept calling him Johnny Burrito. I said, I no, that. that's not his name. <laughs> I, I would call myself Johnny Burrito if it was acceptable. Yeah. But people uh, I mean, after that. after ten days in 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 uh, in Phoenix, I was Eno Taco. So yeah, <laughs> you were you know. absolutely were. I'm with the Umbrita. We talked about the just the major shift in park factors, leaving Yankee Stadium, going to Petco. The problems he had at home last year with the long ball that gets cut down considerably. So I think that gives him a really nice floor. Uh, kind of one of those guys that's a big winner from the offseason that people don't talk a lot about. I like him as a favorite for that spot as well. But they have a couple of young prospects that will probably get a chance in that rotation before the end of the season. Uh, Snelling makes the most sense, I think, of that group. Let's. Uh, oh, by the way, Snelling has quads. You know, I, 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 like, I, was, I think it's after Strider, I've been like, Oh yeah, quads. I mean, like with the with the like uh, with the it, what's the the kinetic chain, right, Trevor? Mm -hmm. Like it, yeah. kind of everything comes like kind of up out of the ground and like towards your shoulder and out to the arms is like that's the kinetic chain. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, like you can have a guy like Chris Sale. Obviously, it works. But you know, when I see a guy now with quads, I'm like, I notice it. Yeah. <laughs> and Snelling has those like I'm a workhorse quads. You know, yeah. just like. I'm a solid dude. I can do 180. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. But that's what we're, that's our standard now. Just like, what kind of quads he got? Oh, right. yeah. That guy got through 200 innings easy. <laughs> how much does he squat? Yeah. Just ask him, how much are you squatting? Squat. <laughs> that's a, it's a big one. The uh, breaking news scrolling by here from the Live Hive. Shout out to James, uh, regular listener of the show. Robert Stevenson still feeling some shoulder discomfort. Kind of a, frustrating spring for him so far might leave our, our guy Carlos Estevez even though his pants were bothering him at the beginning of spring training he still may be the closer there if uh if that injury lingers for Robert Stevenson so we'll keep tabs on that but uh again shout out to the live hive love those comments keep them coming we'll take some questions at the end of the show let's get to some new faces in new places you know you've just kind of brought one up in passing that you want to talk about Chris Sale a big addition to the Atlanta rotation, and they also extended him too. How are things going to be different for Chris Sale 
in Atlanta? Is it just a clean bill of health and a fresh start outside of Boston? Or is there more to it than that? I think one is psychological, which is just like, you know, the last three, I think it's the last four seasons. He has like 160 innings and probably not the best feeling with like the Boston staff. And like, you know, just like, I think there's, you know, if he was honest about it, he would say that it was getting to be a slog there, you know, where, you know, always the questions about innings, I'm sure, you know, every time a reliever, a, a, a journalist is talking to him or he goes on a show or something, they're talking about his health, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, and you, or you turn on the local talk radio, like how many days we're going to get out of there? He's going to start 30 for us. You know, like whatever that was, that was not really a, a Boston, Boston accent. But, <laughs> crushed it. That was more and more just like a, a talking head voice. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I think a fresh psychological start is a big deal. You get on a team that has aspirations for making the world series. That's like, you know, it's all, it's like a, let's it's an LF g moment you know what i mean i feel like he was probably pretty happy to to, to hear that phone call but another thing that's interesting is, and we're going to get less and less of this over time because we're we have a new schedule that's like more and more balanced you have to face everybody else in the league at least once you know and so it, you know we're trying to sort of balance the schedule out we didn't have that for a lot of the last four or five years. And so I looked at his starts in the last four years. He had 99 starts in the last four years. Uh, 11 of the game were against uh, National League opponents. And of those 11, only, I think, six were against National League East opponents. And so if you are in the National League East, you have not seen much Chris Sale. And I and I and I will point out that no matter what Stuff Plus says, no matter what anybody says, Chris Sale has a fairly unique set of stuff and pitches and arm angles and body type and just i think you want to get comfortable with chris sale you want to like have faced him a lot of times i think the first time that was yeah that was mad dog 100 <laughs> percent nailed it definitely mad dog yeah. but uh yeah so i just think that you know i think for the national league east batters it's going to be an uncomfortable situation for them this year they're going to be see yeah exactly sliders from first base um and for the lefties going to be something they haven't seen in a long time and for righties they're just still going to have to see all these elbows and all those you know knees coming at them so i i think uh i think it'll just be one of those things and, and from stuff research we have seen that people do get comfortable with shapes over time so, you know, the people who haven't seen Chris Sale are going to have a harder time with them than the people who have. What do you think about that fit, Trevor? I I agree wholeheartedly. I think he fits into that. It, it also, like the looks from their rotation, um, you know, now mm -hmm. they got they got Freed, who is funky in his own right. Uh, they got Morton, who's funky in his own right. They got Strider, who's a little bit more of a classical right at you guy. So, like, they got all of these different looks and you slot him in there. It's it's. It's just not a, there's no comfort, there's no day where you're like, okay, here's our, you know, here's our Joe Random, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, creative player, right? Where yeah. we're going to see uh, the, the guy I always use. And I, I know this person, uh, but I always said the Dylan G, uh, if you remember him. <laughs> he was very, <laughs> he was very straightforward. Um, you could have, you know, you, you could see his, uh, his mechanics on any street corner, uh, but like they don't have one. So mm -hmm. you add him in there, it's, it's, it's going to be really tough for a team uh, to to get used to him. Um, you know, I know that from from experience too. Guys talking about him, uh, uh, like that was like Tory Hunter's big thing was like trying to give guys uh, that hadn't faced him before like uh, as much information before as possible because he was just a unique guy to face. You know, that was in his prime too. So you got to add that in. But uh, he's that type of guy. He's always going to be like that. Even when as his stuff kind of gets older and his stuff diminishes a little bit, he's still going to be funky. And so he's still going to be able to get guys out in different ways. And he's really smart, knows how to pitch. So it's just a great fit. And then, like, I like the I like the take on the Boston. There's some baggage. Uh, sometimes you just need a clean slate. You need to kind of not have the the stigma that you feel like you might have. And then, uh, you know, it's nice to know another team wants you, too. Mm. So, like, it's it, there's a lot of that. And he, it, he doesn't need to be the ace either. So, like, mm -hmm. there's a lot of pressure off there that uh just sometimes you need to get kind of going again so it's just a really great i think situation for him and uh surprise braves great move yeah. yeah got the extension done with chris sale as well i think that's the thing i look at from kind of like a fantasy perspective and say hey this is a team that makes good decisions they still believe there are a lot of productive years left i thought that previously it seemed like around the injuries the biggest issue would be occasional lapses in command which probably was the result of rust more than anything else so mm. i could see that being a really one, good fit 
One little interesting side story there is that they they acquire Chris Sale and extend him before uh, Max Fried. So yeah. You know, Max Fried has the forearm strain. Is it because they've seen something where they're like, we, we're worried about that? I mean, but, but to say we're worried about Max Fried and then to extend Chris Sale, it's like a little funny. So yeah, um, maybe maybe they'd done some early engagement with Max's agent and we're like, oh, like those numbers are not, we're not, we're not close. Like, you know, so maybe something like that. But it is, it is kind of interesting. I think if I was Max Fried, I'd be a little bit like, what? what? <laughs> I, I think if you're Max Free, I mean, he's 30 years old already. He's got one really great shot at the mega big, deal. Big contract. If he, gets yeah. to, if he goes through this season completely healthy, he's going to get a ton of money this winter. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's part of the appeal for him waiting it out. Another guy with Funk came up a little earlier in the show. Josh Hader gets added to a real strength. I mean, Houston's bullpen, at least their A bullpen, I think their whole bullpen was already good. And they're the team that went out and got Josh Hader. And Trevor, if you gave me five guesses as to where Hader was going to sign, the Astros wouldn't have been any one of those five. So uh, how do you like this move from Houston's perspective? Yeah, um, I don't think people are realizing. It's Josh Hader, right? So he's, you know, I think he's been the most consistently dominant closer for the last five years. Easy. Um, and you know, a lot of people are like, well, what about Edwin Diaz? Edwin's had a couple day, years where he wasn't that guy. Uh, Josh uh, outside of a, a one month stretch has been like a one five ERA guy, like never giving up any runs and never blowing anything. So it's, it's, he's as automatic as you could possibly get. And you add him to, uh, Ryan Presley, who, uh, maybe was second most automatic. Uh, <laughs> and then you add. Brian Abreu in the seven eight so nasty he so let's just put it this way Brian Presley has the record for most scoreless innings or appearances in a row for a a, a a reliever and I'm pretty sure Abreu is like third second <laughs> third, yeah. so they both have three month plus stretches where they've not given up a run and then you add that to Hader who's probably been even more consistent over the last five years than them so like. The game's over if you're winning going in the seventh <laughs> inning. It just it is. Um, and I keep saying, well, it's gonna stop at some point. It just hasn't yet. Uh, so I I I just don't understand like I don't I can't see a world where it would have to be injuries, like they have to not be pitching for some reason. And that you just don't see one three guys like that. Everyone's got like some guys have two, some teams have two, and then you got like two guys that are will 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 be like matchups in the seventh or whatever. It doesn't matter left, right, left or right. He's coming up, whatever. Those three guys are going to face uh, whoever it is coming up, and it's going to be every single time they're in that position. And that is something that you can just literally check that box and not have to worry about it anymore. That is a luxury that nobody else will have the way they have it. So that is, uh, I mean, you can maybe make the case for maybe the, Yan the Yankees, but like even them, like it's not or quite even or the twins like like not quite the same thing not the mm -hmm. track record not there yet like Griffin Jacks could be there uh, mm -hmm. he could be a Brian Abreu like put it put together one of those runs he just hasn't done it yet so it's like those guys are doing it and doing it now so I think he adds he just fits so perfectly and uh the game's when the game's over and you can just count on that now you're starting pitchers like only have to throw six innings and <laughs> you're great it also reminds me what you're saying about different looks uh from the Braves rotation yeah uh, I think they're pretty different looks. I mean, haters way out there with the side army weird rise ball thing. Uh, Brian Abreu is your traditional power dude, like just power at you, like high nineties with a with a like a mid like low nineties breaking ball, just like it's just ah uh, you know at yeah. you. And then Ryan Presley comes out there almost like an internet Charlie. I mean, not internet a, re a reliever Charlie Morton. Yeah, you know, like just a guy who throws like an eighty-five mile an hour two plane breaking ball. And we'll talk a little bit more about curveballs in this episode, but and, and Ryan Presley's features uh, highly there. But it's just like it's such a tough curveball. It's just yeah. like you know everything kind of comes off of that, you know. Um, and he's got two two really good breaking balls. So you've got your spin guy, you know, you've got your power guy, and then you've got your funk guy. And the funk guy, oh well, he also throws ninety five, ninety six. So like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, he touches he touches a hundred even. So yeah, uh, I think it's. It's amazing to be able to just end a game, maybe even at the sixth inning. You get Rafael Montero there too. He's really good. He'd be yeah. probably an eighth inning guy in a lot of other bullpens. So really nice addition, of course, with Hader joining the fray in Houston. I'll throw my first name out there. I'm going to go a little deeper. Not a surprise, being a Brewers guy, but DL Hall. Like 
they're going to use him as a starter. You can tell by how he's being stretched out this spring. They also need him to be a starter this year because their rotation is a bit of a mess. They're going to cobble it together, maybe do some raise like stuff. Makes sense with Matt Arnold having originally come from there when he was the assistant GM a few years ago. But DL Hall has a deep arsenal of, with multiple plus pitches. It's just a question of command. And we were seeing it just for a little while at AAA last year. He was working as a starter, had a really nice stretch. They needed him in the bullpen. They decided to make the move there instead. Am I out of my mind for thinking that DL Hall could actually be a really good starter already in year one with Milwaukee? Not necessarily be a guy that fully replaces Corbin Burns or you know, Brandon Woodruff or anything like that, but could he actually be more of a stabilizing presence for them than people are giving him credit for? I'm I'm a fan. I mean, one one of the reasons that I'm a fan is that I think that once you get to the major leagues, there is an opportunity actually to cut your walk rate a little bit. And that's because you're working with the best framer in an organization, probably. Like I don't I doubt there's not many organizations that have a better framer in triple A or in double A than they have in the big leagues. So you're working with the best framer, you're working with your best, you know, coaches, your best like sort of game prep coaches. Maybe you were game prepping pretty well in the minors. There's gonna be a little step up. And then you're working like, you know, all of the analysis, the R&D, everything is just a little bit crisper on the major league level because they're just that's where the focus is. That's where you that's where you need to win games. And so, you know, uh, you're going to stop with some developmental stuff, too. Like, let's say you have one pitch. You really can't command that well. But they're in, in double A and triple A. They're like, yeah, yeah, keep throwing that thing until you get a good feel for it. Then you get to big leagues. Now nah, we got to win today. Uh, sorry, you're not throwing that change up very much. You know, like it's mm -hmm. you just can't command it. So there's all these sort of like winnowing down things that happen when you get to the major leagues that can actually help a walk rate. And uh and I think, uh, you know, he's got enough stuff where he could actually stop throwing one of those pitches if he can't command it and still be a good pitcher. Uh, if he was just a two pitch pitcher and like couldn't command either of them, I might be more, you know, I don't know what's going to happen here. But if he has pitches where he could lose one and still be good. I agree. Uh, and by, you nailed it, by the way. That is something that is very real. Um, and I actually did it, too. I had a much higher walk rate in the, in the minors than I did in the big leagues. Um, and that is because there's just a lot of like your developmental you're doing developmental stuff you're kind of like failing i don't want to say on purpose but like the 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 organization doesn't mind as much too so you're more willing to go show how nasty you are to get to the big <laughs> leagues um and take <laughs> shots like that and you also like the incentive to like be really dominant like you're taking more shots to get and guys are like swinging at more bad pitches so you and, like, the, and the umpires are worse and the umpires are worse. so like you add all those things in like you can you can get swings and stuff you're not gonna get swings in the big league so you, it forces you to kind of remove that from the back of your head like this is okay if i throw this here and then you you get a little you feel a little bit better about um throwing the ball in the box and then also you're like it's the big leagues i'm gonna give it more hits probably like i'm just not mm -hmm. gonna be more dominant here so like you it, it's an acceptance thing mm -hmm. and the confidence is is you look at it differently and that has a especially for me very you know i'm i'm very much in my head at all times as you can tell so like it just made it it made it like simpler if anything so uh you could commit to not to like throwing the ball over the plate more often and and he's he's disgusting i i see him on the on the stuff plus top list already too up there um and he hasn't really been up there so like it's 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 gonna be really fun to watch and and i think they got somebody who's potentially a, a big factor in brewer success this year and they may have to be careful with how they manage his innings he might be the kind of guy that gets skipped a couple of times around the all-star break if they're contending then of course they'll They'll do some things to make sure he's available later in the year. So the shape of his season might be a little bit different if everything's going well for him as but a he's starter. He's gotten but... pretty close to 100 like a few times. Like, yeah, you know, not necessarily last year because there was some injury. But uh, if you look back, like he's, he's gotten to like 95, you know. Yeah, you're uh, probably thinking like a 130, 140. He's also, I mean, he's, he's 25. They'll probably push him a little harder than if he was like 22. I think that's right. kind of a factor and. Like the team sort of making these things up as they go along, at least it, it really feels like that. And based on a lot of the conversations you've had with front office people, so it still seems like they're, yeah, this seems about right. Just kind of making chili instead of having a, a science to something. That you, you know, and I, and I asked somebody mean. about Paul Skeens in particular and was like, you know, do, would you think about this in terms of like innings or you'd be like, 
well, we just track the things and the things and we do the workload and we see, you know, like, oh, if the thing drops, then we then we take them out. And he's like, no, you have to talk about things in innings on some level because you have to plan your season. You have to be like, where is he going to be at what time? And like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if we have aspirations for making the postseason, how many innings do we keep in the bag, you know, in for October? You know, and how do we do that? How do we manage the shape of the season? So to some extent, you know, there's a number for Paul Skeens hanging around in that front office somewhere. They've decided what it is. Uh, they may push past it if, hey, they're making the playoffs and, and he looks good. But th they still talk about things in this weirdest number, which is innings. It's just a weird number to think of if you think about it, because it's like innings are so different. There's like the inning where you had, you know, 10 guys on and gave a bunch of runs uh, or there's like the inning where you threw four pitches <laughs> and like got out of the inning. Like there's the same thing. We're just those are innings. That's it. You know, yeah. so but so there's still some it's a little bit retrograde, but there's still some like, you know, we've got a number of innings in our head for DL Hall. We're going to manage him around that and uh, hope hope to leave a couple couple starts in the in the holster in case we make the postseason. Let's get to another one. I actually like this move when the Mariners made it because we talked about their second base situation and described it as weird before they made this trade. Trevor, you like Jorge Polanco going to Seattle. Why do you like that fit so much? Uh, few reasons. Uh, I know Jorge very well. So that's that's one. I have a little bit of a, um, inside knowledge there. I know what type of player he is and like how he goes about his work. Um, he's... He it's second base has just been an enigma for the Mariners over the last few years. Like they're just like, why can we get somebody to like, you know, since basically since Cano left, they're just like, I, yeah, they've gone through guys, Adam Frazier, we'll, yeah, we'll just rotate guys through, and then the, yeah. those pretty much every one of those guys have been tried in another position at some point. So, uh, so Jorge, he he is very much a a I think middle of the road type of defender, but they have an elite defender at short. So, like, I think that they'll work together. I don't think they necessarily need, uh, you know, a, a gold glove at, at second, but he has a career uh, OPS plus of 115, which is very, very good, very solid. I would even say in 2019, he was probably our best all-around hitter uh, on that Twins team that hit 307 homers. I don't think that a lot of people think of him when they think of that team, mm -hmm. but uh he, he is a he's a very good natural hitter. Yes, his swing and miss has been up a little bit more recently, but he's also a switch hitter. So like mm. one thing that the Mariners did, and I don't think that uh, I talk to a lot of Mariners fans these days because I'm surrounded by them. And uh, <laughs> one thing they don't realize because they're like, ah, it's the same team again. I'm like, it actually isn't at all. Uh, you have a lot more versatility in terms of righty, lefty, platoons, switch hitters, uh, the way to kind of mix up your lineup in order to get it like very, very off and on, off and on. So matching up with the bullpen is very hard to do now, like things that you couldn't do before. You were like Suarez and then Hernandez back to back, you know, put in your best righty strike them both out. And right, big strikeout over. righties right in a row. Yeah. yeah, they might hit a homer, but like if it's, you know, if they're facing your best guy, if Abreu is going in there, they're not going to take him deep. So, uh, or even maybe even touch it. So he's going to strike them out probably. And that's just not the case anymore. Um, and I think that Julio is going to be helped by Polanco because I think he's going to hit so either before or after him uh, most often. And uh, I think that that's going to even open up more, more pitches for him to hit because he's just, a, he's more of a contact guy than those other two guys were too. So I just think he just generally makes this team better in so many different ways. But again, Health has been a concern the last couple of years. Um, it's been lower extremity stuff a little bit. So he's, you know, you, you don't, it's kind of hard to tell with those things. But if he can stay healthy and, he, and he's in that lineup, and even if he's just like the basic version of himself, he's going to make that team like a lot better. Yeah, yeah it's he's, funny. He's, yeah. he's changed over time. He's become this guy that gets to a lot more power. He used to yeah. be a, like a good hit tool with kind of ample power, a little bit of speed, but. Double digit barrel rates, three straight seasons. I mean, the K rate going up might be a little bit of function of how he's approaching hitting now, but it's a trade off that you'll make. He's turned himself into a guy that can hit 25 or 30 homers, which is not something I would have thought about him at the beginning of his career. You you guys both mentioned his hit tool ability, and, and there's been something that's been kind of uh, a, a common thread for Mariners acquisitions, I think, has been guys who don't strike out too much. Teoscar aside, they've had a lot of guys that they brought in there that uh, can make contact, and that is a bit of a, a segue to my guy who left Seattle, 
Uh, and one of the reasons I want to bring up the uh, the park factor there, there's a it, Seattle increases strikeouts by most than more than almost any other park in baseball. I don't know exactly why, but Teoscar has talked about it in terms of not being able to see the ball. Um, and so, you know, getting guys with good hit tools and bringing them to Seattle, maybe they think you are more likely to be able to handle this park. You know, like you are going to put some balls in play and whatever this strikeout park factor, whatever it is about our park that increases strikeouts, like you're going to be able to handle it because you have a good natural hit tool. Teoscar, I think one of the reasons I'm kind of excited about him in LA is just like also it's a little bit like the sale thing where like he's it's no longer on him. You know, he might be hitting sixth or whatever. Like, you know, it's like it's it's just a superstar lineup. They're just like, hey, you do your thing. Hit us a homer every two games, three games. Like, you know, we're you know, that's all we're asking out of you. But there's this quiet thing about him, which is he just left the place that augments strikeouts by, you know, second most in the big leagues to a place that's further down that list. Uh, I think Dodger Stadium is like sixth or seventh on uh, on that list. So, um, you know, he could just with this settling in factor with the, you know, no, like I'm not one of the main guys, um, you know, and then also think about other teams preparing for the Dodgers. So you're going to be like, what do we do about Otani? What do we do about bets? What do we do about Freeman? Yeah, and you're going to, and like, if you're in the pitcher meeting, like you're the starter with the catcher and you're in the pitcher meeting, you're going to spend a lot of time on Obetz and Otani and Freeman, you know, because you're going to be like, how, what do we do in the first at bat? What do we do in the second at bat? You're going to be thinking about all of it. When you get to Tosker, just be like, okay, uh, he doesn't like this. He doesn't like this. Uh, good enough. Let's go. You know, <laughs> like you only have limited time to talk about these guys. So, you know, there's some point where you make a lineup so deep that like, the last guy you you're just like hey sliders in the dirt and you know and and fastballs up high let's go <laughs> that happens like the extra focus on the top hitters in a loaded lineup like that where the kind of the bottom half guys even though they're still really good and dangerous too they they're just not quite you're not as prepared for them as you are for the the big hitters you can't approach so you the best way to kind of approach a team is to pick you can't pick the entire team as guys you don't want to beat you because then now you're stressed. <laughs> you're the just whole walk time. everybody or whatever, and you're stressed all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're pitching, you find your that's when you see guys like not getting ahead at all, and then then it doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to sometimes say we're okay if Teoscar Hernandez beats us, which it's almost like the basketball thing. It's like okay, if that guy hits a bunch of threes because we covered everybody else well, then okay, we that's then that that's them literally out playing us we're getting yeah. outplayed at this point and that's kind of but we want to create an ecos or we want to create an atmosphere or a situation where they have to do that to beat us mm -hmm. so and that's your, and that's your best chance especially if you are a little bit less man, like you have less manpower than they do like you're mm -hmm. on paper not as good of a team because there are super teams like that um but and you got to like you so sometimes the ball is going to be in their court um you know, pun intended so it's like uh i i that's that's what happens and that, that that's the type of team where you're like dude and then as a starter it's just exhausting if you if you have more than three guys that that you don't want to beat you if there's more than three it's just there it's too much uh, it's too much to remember and it's just too much you're, you're giving them too much credit at that point because at the end of the day pitching does have the advantage and you can get everyone out the whole time like yeah. it is possible like you could be dialed in if you're at your best you will probably all beat uh the the hitters um almost every single time if you are absolutely dialed in if you're in the zone the pitcher all, pretty much always wins so you have to kind of lean on that it's just harder to do when the, when the team's that deep let's crank one more name out there i'm gonna give up my second name to give Eno a third because oh his submission to the rundown i think is more interesting than mine and i will get my guy in on a future episode don't worry okay. well, i got the rundown i can control the rundown i, I can True. I can make it happen. So I'm gonna sneak in another name along with this name. No, no, you will not. <laughs> no. Like Joey Ortiz in Milwaukee, Mike Soroka <laughs> is joining a, a situation where all there's all the opportunity where that might not have been before. And so just one of the things like we talk about this in fantasy all the time. So the fantasy listeners are like, you know, shaking, you know, nodding along. Opportunity is often as important as quality. And um, I think the A's know this more than anybody. Yeah. They're like, hey, we have opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Anybody who's like, you know, between AAA and the majors, come on over. Check us out. We'll give you a year or two. And then, 
uh, and then we'll see. So uh, Joey Ortiz in Milwaukee now has a, a free open, <laughs> free open uh, situation. And Mike Soroka, the nice thing about Mike Soroka on top of all this is uh, that while he's been rehabbing, he's been changing his uh, his pitch shapes. He's been changing what he's doing. He's he's picked up a four seamer, and uh, he's been more. He's trying to 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 really emphasize the four seamer. He was a sinker guy before, so I think there's. I, I, I'm flying a little bit blind because I don't have Statcast on him. I don't have any of this yet. I just know that that's what he's been trying to do. But the numbers are pretty good uh, in the spring, and the opportunity is there for him. So. You know, he's not going to have to go back down to the minor leagues. The White Sox need him to be a major league starter for him. So it's just like, hey, here you go. You got you got a whole season to to show us what you got. It's 30 starts if he's healthy enough for them. That's mm -hmm. clear, clear opportunity. With the Braves, he'd be up and down. I mean, oh, maybe yeah. we try Smith Shaver instead. Maybe we try this guy. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Go back down and work on it, you know. I always thought when Soroka first broke in that he had kind of this veteran arsenal and approach. He didn't have your typical prospect over the top amazing stuff but he seemed like he really had a plan and he executed it really well and then i saw an interview i think during one of the extended absences he was in the booth for a game he sounded way more polished than a guy in his early 20s like it just i don't know like i have a lot of confidence in him because even without excellent stuff in the past he was able to get some great results it seems like he's finally healthy again and for guys that have multiple years lost to injury i think just having a full runway to go into a season can make all the difference in the world to get back on track yeah, yeah. no baggage no baggage with the white Sox, which is solid <laughs> he's not trying to regain his early glory either which is part of it is mm -hmm. part of it so uh yeah clean slate again i bet you situations I bet you one of his goals, like if he has a personal goal, it's like 25 starts. <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah. something really simple. It's not even like, you know, dominate or whatever. It's like, let me just yeah. let me just have a year in the pitch. major. Yeah, pitch. Pitch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Our featured uh, pitch deep dive today is the curveball. And we're going to look first at the stuff plus charts because I think these are, are really helpful. Uh, we have here we have first horizontal versus vertical movement on curveballs. And you know, for both of these, you have Ryan Presley again as the, if you can see the dot, the black dot on the screen, Ryan Presley is the example for both of these charts. And for anybody who's not looking at this, what's interesting about this is that there's red in a lot of different places. There's a lot of different ways to have a good curveball. You can have a good curveball that's a two-planer like Ryan Presley. That's the bottom right hand of this of this graph. You can have a one-planer. That's basically, I think, a sweeper at the top. You'll see some big red at the top that where it doesn't have drop, but it has big sideways. I think those are probably some unclassified sweepers or, or sweeper-like pitches, Chaz Rowey and Frisbees. Um, and then you have uh, a place over uh, on the left side that's also red where it's um, sort of a one plane downer. And, uh, you know, we have a nickname for that, the death ball. Um, it's basically a pitch that just goes down. And uh, there's lots of different ways to get there. We'll talk about it. But these are, you know, three or four different ways to have a good curveball. Um, and I think it all depends on your slot, uh, what you're comfortable doing, if you can kind of you know, tweak that so that it's a little bit surprising in terms of movement. Um, there's a lot of different things going on here, but you know, other graphs were cleaner than this. This is one of those graphs where it's like, you know, pick your pathway forward. What, what, what matches your fastball? What matches your mechanics best? Yeah. And I think that was something that kind of stood out to me when we were talking a little earlier in the week, just about uh, the shape of your curveball. It needs to match everything else really well. Because what I remember a lot in scouting reports, at least like five plus years ago, is you'd see slurve kind of thrown out there. And it always felt like it had a negative connotation. And it doesn't seem like it's always bad. It kind of seems like it depends on what your other stuff looks like. And then there's also the sort of question of when does something stop being a curveball and become a slider and does that line actually matter as much as people think it does i don't know yeah i don't think it matters as much as people think it does because we also talked a lot about how like sometimes things are classified uh on savan or or wherever you're gonna find them based on like what the guy calls it mm -hmm. and that's just the reason they call it that is is something uh in their brain that 
it's like it's attached to a cue or something. So like if they think it's a curveball, they're envisioning a bigger break or something because they grew up thinking that that's what a curveball was. And but in reality, what they're throwing is like some like a death ball that's a slider spin that's kind of loose and goes down because but it looks like it's going to go left. Like there's all these it's weird curveball is probably the widest range of differences um that you can get. Uh it used to be all based on velo. So if you threw like 86, it's not a curveball cuz it's too hard. But right. that's not how it is anymore. And so it, it it it's it's weird and then we have like knuckle curve and then we got 12 6 12 6 which is like the death ball but it's slower. So like the ranges that these things can be in are so wide and they're it's just arbitrary a lot a lot of it's arbitrary um so if you hear a guy like a player talking about it it makes it even more confusing so it's it's hard to talk about kind of like why people are frustrated with sweeper being used so much is because it's hard to tell well first of all a lot of people media people sometimes use it wrong which does not help but uh it's it's more of a a guy trying to, if a guy's designing a pitcher, trying to make a pitch better, which everyone is, like everyone has TrackMan data. They know how, th- everyone knows how hard hard they throw something, how much it moves, and how fast it spins. Like everyone knows that about all the pitches. Yeah. And so when you're tweaking things and making it a little bit different, like if you've always thrown a slider and you're making something a little bit slower and it's breaking a little bit differently, you might call it a curveball because it's not your slider anymore. It's a different pitch than you had before. So you're trying to make that distinction. Uh, and then, but it's it's still just like a different type of slider, technically, if you compare it to other people. So that's not going to go away. That's always going to be there. I think that we're just we just waste time. We're trying to make those distinctions. Uh, but you're you're trying to get the effect. It, just think about the effects of those of those types of pitches. Like a curveball gets a certain type of. Uh, you're trying to get a certain type of swing or an outcome uh, because you're trying to e- get it to move a certain different way. And uh, same thing with a slider and same thing with any other pitch. And if you're thinking in terms of that, uh, it's a little bit easier to follow along with like, uh, like you mentioned before, like some of those might be misclassified sweepers. They probably are. Um, or they would call it a sweeping curve you know, 10 years ago <laughs> uh, because of the below it's 78 miles an hour. So it's a curveball because it's in the right. 70s. Yeah. Um, so those, th- th- that's just going to be, that's going to be around and it's going to get even more probably nuanced. Um, so I would I would pay more attention if you can learn kind of ranges of movements and how they're kind of associated with things you can have a greater understanding and just make guesses uh, based on it and it doesn't really matter what guys are calling it anymore just now you know you kind of know what they mean if you can get a general understanding of that I think it would it, it's it makes it a lot easier to navigate and not so confusing yeah there's, there's like an intent component there almost yeah 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 there's a lot of intent associated you'll never know what that is unless they tell you Right. So if you're so, calling a game, you call it a breaking ball if you don't know. Generally, yeah. That was what Kluber always good. told me. Yeah. That's how I, I was like, what is it, Kluber? What is the oh, Kluber ball? Too, man. He, He's like, it's he had, a breaking ball. He had five variations <laughs> of every single breaking ball he threw, which everything broke. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> in his opinion, he threw 15 pitches. Yeah, but <laughs> and a lot of starters think that way. Yeah. Uh, so p- the uh, pitchers... Um, the pitches that we've picked today, uh, I think, distribu- like showed this uh, perfectly what you're talking about, which is we have three different pitches that are all quote unquote curveballs. Uh, they are all do it in different ways and they're all called different things in Savant. So uh, here is the power curve from Kimbrel. Yeah, let's start with that. And look at that. Ciao. Whoa. 86. Oh, so good. That had that, that had two plane movement. Uh, it's I think more movement than a slider. You know, that's like that's 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 got a lot of movement. Um, that's classified a knuckle curve because that's because that's how he throws it. Yeah. Now, which is a little bit weird because you know, uh, we don't classify all our pitches based on how like the grip, you know, <laughs> but knuckle yeah. curve, we decide it matters that they're um that they use the knuckle. Uh, one thing that I will say to anybody who has kids um or is training people, I did a deep dive on the knuckle curve. And what I found was a, they were harder. I think uh, the knuckle curve allows you to just kind of throw it harder. Um, it's a little bit less manipulation. Um, AJ Burnett uh, called it the FU ball because if you actually hold it a certain way, you see you're flicking people off. Um, and uh, and he also said you also just throw the F out of it. Uh, so uh, <laughs> yeah, that's where I started with my kid uh, because I liked that it was kind of more fastball-y, more just like throw it, throw it hard. Um, but what, like when you start advanced training and you're getting past sort of like nine, 10, 11, and you're getting up to like high school and stuff, if you've got a low slot kid, 
knuckle curves can allow them to get more of a 12 to 6 shape. So Aaron Nola, we didn't get Aaron Nola video on this one, but Aaron Nola has a little bit more of a 12 to 6 shape than you'd expect because he's kind of a two-thirds guy. And so that's good because you're playing with expectations. You see the two-thirds, you think this is going to be too plain slurvy, and then he kind of is a little bit more over the top because holding it in that knuckle allows the ball to sort of, by removing this pinky, by removing this index finger like you do in a knuckle, you kind of spike it. You know, you're getting allowing that ball to get over easier. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it's it, 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 it can spin like vertically as opposed to if you're using two fingers, you got two points of pressure on the ball mm -hmm. and you kind of get a little bit more two plane movement. So the, the knuckle curve allows you to get one plane movement. We got another one here. Uh, this is the Pete Fairbanks. Uh, this is called a slider. That's the death ball. I it's think that's that, ball, that's yeah. the death ball. And God. And Joe Ryan is throwing this now. Um, and the way that I've heard that Joe Ryan is achieving this movement is by spike gripping his slider. So he's taking a hard gyro slider and he's doing a spike grip on it. And that's giving it, it's it, it, like the a gyro slider doesn't have a lot of sideways movement. It's kind of like a, it's called a bullet slider. We talked about it on the last episode, but if you spike it, now you're giving it a little bit of like this, the 12 to six. So that's why you get this like one plane. And that one's a great pitch, I think, for people who have rising fastballs who are very vertical. Um, you know, Shane Bieber was just telling me that he was getting too horizontal on his curveball. And hitters could see it because he was such a vertical pitcher that here's, a, oh, here's this one pitch that's coming at me. Okay. You know, I'm going to get give you a take on that or whatever it is. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for that or I'm looking to not swing on that, you know? Um, and so the death ball can be really good for these vertical pitchers. And then just to do the last video. Uh, the last video is, this is the Charlie Morton, Ryan Presley, Jeez. you know, huge, big two plane, uh, curve ball. I think that's a really good one for, if you want to pitch to your 43, you know, yeah. I don't know. There's, it's just like, it's just really hard for everybody uh adam adam wainwright had a similar pitch you know it's just like a huge big old curveball that uh people pound into the ground and they just can't really don't usually have a, a great swing that's going to like hit that for power you know yeah, yeah. I, I kept looking at that death ball and thinking it gives me some gyro slider vibes with a little more drive. it really is i think it's it, you know that's probably why it calls it a slider because it's yeah. probably a gyro slider with like a spike grip or something yeah. yeah, and I noticed on the video, I replayed it again because I thought I saw something funky. You could tell his hand is gripping the ball in an unusual way. I don't part of it's the camera angle. I'll, I'll throw it one more time. You can kind of see, watch his hand. Just, uh -huh. It's like really, I don't know, for the top. It's hard to see it without slowing it down, but I don't know. I just, I, I saw a gyro is what I saw or something very yeah. similar to a gyro. That is how it spins. It's, it's weird too. As a hitter too, they see like classic slider spin. And it's sometimes the spins a little bit looser, like we talked about last week, which then gives it a little bit more depth and a little bit less horizontal than you're expecting. So, uh, and then gravity takes it. So it's the exact opposite of your ride. So you're right. Um, a guy, I think a guy that did this for really, really well before we knew about the movement was Brad Lidge. Uh, mm. I think Brad Lidge threw a death ball the whole time because he had the depth on a slider that no one else really had. We were like, That's it, interesting. It was he also was, 87. It was yeah, like it was really hard. Too. It was a hard one, yeah. Yeah, when he was throwing really hard. But even then later, when he was like, you know, the velo dropped like 91, 92, and later in his career, and he was battling injuries, it was like 80. You saw that depth. Like, oh, he had a lot of depth, like mm -hmm. curveball depth, which, yeah. but it didn't still didn't go horizontally. Uh, and that was, uh, I'm not exact. I wasn't exactly like that when I changed from my curveball to my slider, but that was one thing they saw was the amount of depth I had on a slider, because that's what I was doing. I was throwing like a kind of a looser spinning gyro that, that had had more depth and it was seven, eight miles an hour harder than my curveball was. So I was like getting not quite as much depth, but close a lot harder. And I had, was I, it mechanically similar or was it very different to your curveball uh, to your slider? Uh, it was mechanically very similar. Yeah. yeah. Um, the grips were completely different, but like mm. in terms of, uh, how I was approaching throwing it and arm slot and everything, it was even closer to the, my, to my fastball. And so there was no pop and, uh, it, it was just a, it was just a better, a better tunneling example before I knew what tunneling was. Cause this was like 20, I don't know, 16. 
when I so made you were that. somewhere you were somewhere between the gyro the gyro slider and the and the death ball. I mean, you had you had some depth on it. I was like trying to throw the gyro. Yeah, like I, I thought that's what I was doing, but we didn't really know what was happening. Um, and so it was. But it like, had more depth than they expected. Exactly. Josh Kalk was the head of analytics at the time. He was like, "You're doing something that I think a lot of people are going to want to do. Or like, <laughs> you're doing something that's really unique." So, so he was really excited. Uh, first time I threw it, like he was ve- way more excited than I ever saw him. And uh, <laughs> fired me up. so then I just it literally took me one day. I was like, "All right, that, that's my new I slider. Throw that, I throw this now. Let's go." Yeah. <laughs> Well, here's the relationship just between velocity and drop. And I mean, harder, generally better, but not always better, right? I mean, I look at this and I see harder is better. I mean, mostly there's some blue spots over there. But uh, the fact that the reddest spots on these on this graph are mostly, uh, you know, one of the ways that it's put in, you know, the halls of driveline and tread and places is it's really hard to throw an 86 mile an hour slider that's bad. I mean, if you just look at that, uh, you know, that line there, uh, the black one is Presley at 82. The next line is 84. And the next line is 86. If you go up and down at 86, there's one blue uh, spot in the graph. And I, I wonder who that is who's, who's throwing around in there, but it doesn't have much depth. So, yeah, if you can get any sort of depth on it, if you can get any uh, anywhere under zero and over 85, it's a it's a good breaking ball. I, I like these graphics that you uh, you churn out, and they remind me of that old game Cubert because of the, <laughs> the shapes. So we got to get a little Cubert just jumping around on the graph. And as a pitcher, like you know, this is the the core use of stuff is not so much evaluative, although we use it that way. It's often d- for development. So you can see where your slider is, and you can see well, what's the easiest way for me to get off of blue and on red? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, can I get a little more horizontal and get over to that red one? Or is it easier for me to get a little more drop and get on that red one? There was one really interesting thing about that graph. You want to throw it up one more time. Uh, the, the 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 A good rule of thumb for, for the listeners and watchers at home is the idea of a zero, zero. So if you just go to zero on the left here and look across, there's blue and then there's red, then there's blue again. So that red is like 78 miles an hour. And the blue is that 186. So that a zero zero is commonly referred to as like that's where the dead zone is. Like that's the overlap for pretty much every pitch, every breaking mm. ball anyway. And so the harder, like that puts it right in where a hitter sees the velo and makes a distinction and it's moving kind of what they're predicting. But if it's if it's not moving that much and it's slower, it's weird and they're swinging under it. But if it's harder and moving more. Then it's weird and they're swinging over it so that's so where that... like zero zero is kind of the dead zone for breaking ball yeah it just it generally if you think like zero zero is not quite what you're looking for so you either need it to be slower than they're thinking it that's when velo matters the most or like a frisbee or like yeah, yeah. something you want it to yeah. spin so they're like oh that's gonna break a lot and it doesn't break at all that was that's like the dice k like uh, uh, yeah. uh, and they're just under it and it's weird uh it's not Elysia so hernandez it's had a weird thing that like it went like 78 and it moved like a cutter and it was like, was what that? is happening here? <laughs> what like, is come in. Thing? Hitters will literally come in and be like, what is that? And then <laughs> yeah. look like, I, I don't know. And then you got them. At that point, you got them. They're, they're, they're done. <laughs> that's, uh, that's usually a question hitters don't like to ask. Yeah. What Someone comes that? in saying, what was that? <laughs> Everyone else in the lineup's like, great. Here we go. Yeah. You've done your job as a pitcher if that's the yeah. reaction that you're getting from hitters. Uh, and Hernandez, by the way, uh, in the bullpen, I think for the Dodgers right now, kind of curious to see what kind of uh, tweaks they might make with him, given the unusual Probably just stuff throw that already. weird ass thing a bunch of times in the sixth inning and get us through this inning. Yeah, yeah. Throw the creature eighty <laughs> percent of the time, and, yeah. and everything will work itself out. I got a few questions here from uh, our listeners and viewers. This one came from Discord from Anya C. Which spring training stat do you pay attention to the most, and why? I'll throw it to you first. You know. Uh, I think probably a similar one on both sides is strikeout rate. Um, it's just in terms of results, it's the easiest. It's the thing that matters in a month. Uh, you've got a month, you got six weeks. So in a month, you can actually say something about a hitter strikeout rate and a pitcher strikeout rate. Um, and in terms of results, that's the number one thing. There's some process stuff, but it's really hard to like look at velo right now because some of those guys are pitching two innings and they got to pitch five innings the next time out. I saw Jack Flaherty was throwing uh, like 95, 96 in his first outing. That was uh, like an inning or two. Uh, in his next outing, he sat 93, but 
actually it was interesting. He had 96 when it was two strikes and when mm. it was, you know, when he wanted to finish the at bat off, he still, he was kind of doing the Verlander where he's trying to keep 96 in his back pocket. Um, but it's just hard to know right now what a pitcher is going to sit at because there's, they're still in that sort of two to three inning stint and it's maybe they're just airing it out now and you don't know what they're going to do later. Yeah. I like strikeout rate as well. I'll, I'll throw another one out there. I just like, Plate, like plate appearances. I just want to know who's playing because what I'm trying to figure out is just what's happening in job battles. Such a, a huge part of our fantasy analysis, trying to figure out where playing time shifts might be happening. It is not easy to decode. Who does it, the manager believe in? Yeah, like who are you? And also who are you playing with, which obviously isn't a stat, but that's just one of those things. If I see a number that surprises me in either direction, I start looking at some lineups, kind of figure out like, okay, what are they doing with this a squad guy or B squad? Is he leaving in the sixth inning or not? <laughs> Taking the three hour ride in Florida or or not? Is he staying? Oh, home? that's yeah. true too. Yeah, who's taking? Who's on the visiting squad? Yeah, I noticed that one. Yeah, because we went to the Padres Angels and the Padres are visiting and they did not take a single regular. I apologize to my son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll parrot that. I'd say uh, how many home games is planning. <laughs> that's that's how you know how seriously that team or like how how seriously you can take that guy making the team uh guys don't go on the road unless if they're locked in frankly i i i said no uh to go on the road <laughs> i actually went on the road way more than i wanted to last year uh but uh yeah that's 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 an indicator uh and then for me just from a like a process standpoint for like looking at yourself um i i was always just like seeing uh if if we mentioned velo for me it was like just making sure that it was slowly increasing or that i was close to kind of where i wanted to be in general you know i'll be down a couple because it's going to be april wherever we go anyway so it's gonna be cold uh probably and it's gonna be down but uh just seeing making sure health wise that like everything's moving close and that that progression is happening over over time so from where i started to where i began there's a positive progression um and that that was just just generally knowing that stuff and that's also during the season so just getting getting rolling there um and then in terms of like and also strikeout rate was was big for me and for looking at our team too because you can show what type of uh stuff you have at the moment but also like th it's another indicator of everything i just said so like yeah and it's working and, right. and yeah. things are working, working no matter who i'm facing even if it's young kids who've never seen me before and i've never seen them and i'm not really following a plan you can just go stuff on stuff that's mm -hmm. usually a good uh, a good good thing I would pay attention to. Like, am I getting the kids out? Am I getting the guys out that that I don't know anything I about? Should, yeah. Um. That that's a good indicator of how my things are are working. Oh, there is one more that I actually want to throw out there too. Stolen bases and stolen base attempts. Our friend Jason Collette took a really good look at that uh, from last year with the new rule changes, and it actually lined up really well. The the stolen base rates from spring training kind of poured it over to the regular right. season, so you can get a sense of who. Is going sure. to be more aggressive, maybe on a player and a team sort of level, at least some signal there. So like, I think the Nationals are running pretty wild. Lane Thomas has like six or seven stolen bases already. Have fun. They should yeah. enjoy that. Might as well. <laughs> it could be something to watch for in Washington. <laughs> Have fun, Ottavino. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Ottavino, by the way, tons of clips of him working on his throat at first. <laughs> yeah, he, said he, he said he was going to do it. He's like, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to. This is the year, finally. 38 years old. I'm going to figure out how old my <laughs> Thanks a lot Reminds for that me question. Of those, Lester, those Lester years. Or yeah. oh, there was a Tommy geez. Pham was like eight, eight, like eight steps off the bag. It was so, like watching Rookie of the Year, but with grown-ups like, doing this stuff on the base paths. Yeah. Like, incredible. Uh, one more here from Andy D. Toy. This is a question for Trevor. When you were making a plan to face a new lineup, do you tend to put more weight on hitters' weaknesses or your pitching strengths? Uh, it always came down to how much information was in what I looked at. Um, uh, you know, there was a lot of times where we'd face like uh, like the Pirates in recent years. Like there'd be like five guys, so it was very very little data on because you don't really trust AAA stuff that much because of the way we everything we mentioned before with development and stuff. So um, I would stay try to stay uh, strengths most often there. Um, try to keep it as simple as possible. I think I talked about this when we talked about the the catcher uh, targeting and stuff. So this came into play much more last year, but it, it was already pretty simple even when I knew a lot about a guy. So it became even easier to get ready for these guys. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I sometimes I re revert to like generalizations about like righty hitters generally can't hit this thing. Lefty hitters generally like lefty hitters generally hit down and in well, like all of them for some reason and righties generally hit like up and out over 
up and away better. And it was just like the way it was. Uh, so I, I would just kind of revert to my generalizations, try to keep it simple and then, and then build off that. And then on top of all of that, I just wanted to make sure I knew the guys I didn't want to beat me in that lineup and that those guys were taken care of. Uh, and, and it like kind of made it specific scouting report on those. Yeah. Guys. So, so if I only had a couple guys in the lineup that I knew a lot about, I would just make sure I had that locked in and then just reverted to my strengths for the rest of the lineup. Cause that's pretty much the best you can do, but you, you try to look for specifics first and then you go to strengths when you don't have as much information. Yeah. Well, I, I like the one thing that, uh, uh, Pedro Martinez said that has always stuck out for me is that if you watch a player, when they stand up at the plate, when they're doing their practice swing, uh, you can actually tell what kind of a hitter they are. So Wilmer Flores, when he comes to the plate, it's all this high, it's like this high, high flat swing. You're like, oh, that's a high ball huh. hitter right there, you know? And these guys come up here and practice a little low swing, right? When they get in there. I mean, I, a hitter could manipulate that and play it with should, that. Yeah. But uh, Pedro said, if I didn't know who the guy was, I just watched him practice swing and I knew something about him. You can do it with Soto too. The shuffling yeah. and the head shaking and stuff—you can pay attention to it, and you can tell what he what he was expecting, what he's thinking, if he's mad at himself for not getting the thing that he was looking for, or if he, you actually like surprise him a little bit. He shows you, and mm. I think guys picked up on that a little bit more uh, the yeah. longer he's playing, and I think he's doing it a little bit less. Uh, but yeah, that, there's there's stuff like that if you can get it. There's like uh, some people will like hit their back leg, like their back hip after stay uh back, stay back yeah 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 like they're like stay in there stay no, in there no heater yeah <laughs> <laughs> last one here before we go this one's from saul how much do you guys pay attention to o swing percentage on breaking balls i remember reading on prospects live that chase rate is the best proxy we have for deception and tunneling hmm right, this is sort of what we were thinking about the biggest miss rate mm -hmm. yeah you know yeah it's it is it is a big big indicator actually that article that we've actually talked about quite a few times uh uh actually my co-host on uh sirius xm danny westman sent the same article to me it's like have you read this and i'm like i actually made <laughs> yeah. a youtube video about this yeah uh, <laughs> the art of pitch tunneling that is the prop prep, uh proposition they make is that uh the better the tunnel the more often the chase rate is effective and it's mm -hmm. high it goes up um and i actually changed grips to to chase that because i was like no one's was chasing the pitch uh and so i think there's a direct correlation there 100 percent um, did it work for you yeah it did work actually the first yeah. the first slider i hadn't gotten a swing and miss on slider in literally like two months oh, I think a lot of ground balls and stuff and a lot of takes uh yeah. change it was good but at the time and i was getting a lot of fastball swing and misses but my slider was like not a swing and miss pitch first one i threw back strikeout and this is like, the switch to the gyro yeah, this is a switch to the harder gyro. And then you were I, saying like, it didn't have a hump, so it didn't. It didn't have didn't, a hump. It was eighty-eight instead of eighty-two. Yeah, and it was honestly like a little elevated and a little not a great like pit, but he swung over it like like uh, emergency swing, and I was like, yeah. I must have tunneled with my fastball that I had just thrown him much much better than it has mm. in the past. So they're onto something. I think I don't know if the the ranges that they pro uh, proposed are a little bit different. They probably have been adjusted a little bit, but like there is some there is some veracity to that. Yes. I wonder if that's also something you could look at if you were looking at pitchers who win in the shadow zone. We were talking about you know, swings versus take and it takes in the shadow zone. The pitchers that do well in that maybe have effective tunnels. Like that might be. Yeah, that's what something. we were saying. That like it's really hard to analyze the shadow zone without breaking it down by pitch type because a fastball in the shadow zone is something you still kind of want, and a breaking ball in the shadow zone is like absolutely as a hitter you do not want to swing at that. Yeah. You know. So you know, and then. You know the pairing of it. If you thought it was a fastball and you got a slider in the, in the shadow zone, you really wish you didn't swing at that. Yeah. <laughs> well, a lot to chew on here, and uh, we'll take some requests. I think in our Discord, be sure to join that if you haven't done so already. The links in there. We'll have Trevor and you know kind of break down how they would game plan to pitch to some hitters. We'll try to do that over the course of these next few shows because there's a infinite list of possibilities with something like that. So. If we get some popular requests, I think we can make it sort of a by request segment that we plan for. If you've got questions for a future episode, you can also send them to us, ratesandbarrels at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter. Trevor is at I am Trevor May. Eno is at Eno Saris. I'm at Derek Riper. The pod is at Rates and Barrels. Thanks to our producer, Brian, for doing all the hard work behind the scenes. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to like this video on YouTube. Leave us a nice rating and review. Thanks again to the Live Hive for hanging out to us, hanging out with us today. Fridays, one o'clock Eastern. Next Friday, no live stream because we have two live shows at Other Half, Domino Park location, 
Wednesday and Thursday next week. Doors, 3 o'clock, pod, 6.30, apparently. So, (laughs) 6.30. It's not a moving target anymore. 6.30 start time for both of those shows. Thanks for listening to Rates and Barrels. We're back with you next week. Thanks for listening.